Hey there, entrepreneur. Welcome back to another fascinating episode of Fascinating Founders. I'm your host, Nicole Holland, and I'm thrilled to be your guide as we dive in and uncover the stories that came before the success of some of the world's most fascinating founders. Hailing from a multitude of industries and socioeconomic starts, you're going to learn what's made these fascinating men and women realize their dreams from an inspired idea to millions in revenue, disrupting, innovating, and impacting humanity for the better. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Podcasting Goldmine. Are you reaching and converting your ideal buyers through podcasts yet? You'd better believe that your competition is. The podcast industry is exploding right now, with billions of dollars being poured into it and well over 1 million active podcasts in the directories. In just the past 90 days alone, hundreds of thousands of new podcasts have been added, and the industry will continue to grow whether or not you're a part of it. Your market, my friend, is listening to podcasts, and I would love to personally help you design a strategic podcast marketing plan to help your company scale and reach your business growth goals through podcasts. From getting you featured as the expert guest on premium podcasts that your ideal buyers are already listening to, to designing and launching a profitable podcast for your company, to show sponsorship and advertising, podcasting for business growth is totally my jam. If you're ready to take a serious look at how you can effectively leverage podcasts for business growth, Visit podcastinggoldmine.com and request a complimentary consultation for us to explore how we can make podcasts work for you. Again, that URL is podcastinggoldmine.com. Now, you never know what we're going to get into on an episode of Fascinating Founders. So get your notebook ready, cozy up with a great cup of joe, and let's dive into another inspiring journey with today's guest. Oh, I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. Yancy Strickler is a writer and entrepreneur. He's the co-founder and former CEO of Kickstarter, the author of This Could Be Our Future, a manifesto for a more generous world, and the creator of Bentoism. Yancy is also a distinguished fellow at the Drucker Institute and has been named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. He's one of Fortune's 40 Under 40 and one of Fast Company's most creative people. He's spoken at MIT, Stanford, the Museum of Modern Art, Sundance, Tribeca Film Festival, Web Summit, and at startups, nonprofits, companies, and schools around the world. Yancy co-founded the artist resource Creative Independent and the record label eMusic Select. Yancy began his career as a music critic in New York City and grew up on a farm in Clover Hollow, Virginia, and lives with his family now in Vancouver, Canada. Yancy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. If I knew I would have to sit here for it, I would have sent you something much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is I do look for shorter um, bios, and, and sometimes, usually, I do edit them. But honestly, there was like nothing I could take out of this. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was so fabulous. and. Um, it's, it, it's important that we say all of those things because for those folks who haven't heard of you before and are just learning about you, like you're so dynamic and you've done so many different things. And so I would love to start back in Clover Hollow <laughs> and ask you about that. Like growing up, um, what was it, what was your first like spark of entrepreneurialism? Well, I don't think I was entrepreneurial growing up. I was always a, I was a writer. I was an artist. You know, I was writing sci-fi stories and composition notebooks in fourth and fifth grade, filling, you know, many volumes with a single story. Um, and so I think writing was mostly where that happened. I had a zine in high school. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, my my stepfather is a mechanic who ran his own um, you know, garage. And so I was and I worked on a farm that working farmers work. So I was surrounded by self-employed people, by entrepreneurs. But I myself was a bookworm, you know, and I loved music. And um and, and so, you know, my my pull into entrepreneurship was 
solely by just the perfect Venn diagram of it being a business that lined up with all of my other interests, right? Like I, me as a creative person, me as a, me as a writer, me as um, uh, someone that ended up being kind of a curator, starting a record label, being a music critic, you're kind of a curator. Um, and so those were, those were the skills I was finding early on. And, and, as a, and as a high schooler, you know, a college student, of course, all adults are like, do you know how to do anything useful? <laughs> you know, all you do is read and you write things that, you know, I, every once in a while I read and you know a lot about music and movies, but like, what of those things is the job exactly? Um, and so it was a lot of soft skills that were just things that I naturally gravitated towards. And, you know, just thinking things would work out somehow, uh, not to make sure how, but they, they did, they did. So yeah, let's talk about that then, because coming from, um, I'm somewhat familiar with the area that you grew up in, and it is a smaller area. Um, it's not like, you know, the, the big city. And so how did we go from where you were at and, and the life you were living to being a music critic in New York City? You know, where, where I grew up on the farm in the country, it's real Appalachia, and um but the great thing is that there's a college town nearby. There's Virginia Tech and Blacksburg, Virginia, which just means that there was, there was a good bookstore and there was a good record store. And, and so for me, and those things were both downtown and I would hang out downtown as a kid. And, you know, starting about the age of 12 or 13 would go into those stores. And I just looked up to the people who worked there. So much of it was just like the people that worked there, I could tell they were cool and I wanted to be cool. So I just did what they seemed to like. And there were honestly multiple years of me saving my money and buying CDs, all of which I hated. But like Butch, the guy that worked at the record store was so cool and he would tell me to get them. And I, you know, I knew that Butch was cool and, and I, I could recognize that the one and the wrong here was me and that I had to have just this patience. But I, it was really just modeling myself on people that I looked up to. And I looked up to people for a lot of different reasons. You know, I, I, I was a, um, a very strong, devout evangelical Christian, and there were elders in my church that I looked up to. And, and so a lot of it was just modeling myself on what, on what seemed like that's where I want to be. Um, so I think it was first just aspirational and just having a natural curiosity and and especially you know reading so much in in the pre in the early internet era you know you you read just to find out the names of artists and musicians because it's so hard to even know like who is a musician you know what's a band and like how do you know what those things are and so you just read to glom information to, to learn to expand how you see the world i went to college in virginia at a school called william and mary College was fine. It was fine. I, I did a lot of writing. I made good friends. I did like radio station stuff. Um, but moving to New York was, uh, you know, during college, I, I, I was uh, kind of a townie. I, it wasn't where I grew up, but I, I worked there in the summers and I was the night manager of a day's in. I was a mover for many years. You know, I just had just shit jobs that um, I still look at like those working experiences as being some of the best of my life. And, um, and wasn't really sure where that was going to take me. And then when I graduated college, my, my best friend from high school randomly called and said he and a group of five people had gotten a house in Brooklyn and Coney Island, and there was an extra bedroom. And could I be there, you know, by the end of the week? And, um, and I, because it was such a instant, instantaneous choice, I said, yes, if I had had time to think about it, I, I think I would have talked myself out of it because I'm. I'm a risk averse person in many ways. Um, but I'm just like, yeah, this is when you do these kinds of things. And, and so it was just a total leap, um, a, a total leap, not knowing how, how it would turn out. And, and to be honest, my first couple of years in New York, I, I was fairly miserable. But the trick of New York is that if you go there, you, you are immediately too broke to leave. You're just, tra you're just trapped there. And so, and eventually I came to love it. And then learning learning to have skills in the big city for me as someone who grew up on a farm, it brings you a lot of confidence, a lot of excitement. And I lived in New York for almost 20 years and, and love it very much. Wow. And so what were some of those things that early on um, during those couple of years of just really being too broke to leave, um, but you're learning so much, what were some of those things that 
you can pinpoint help you get or helped you transition into the direction of where you're at now? Or I, I mean, maybe you already had it, right? I just like no, I think there were a couple I think there were a couple of things. I mean, one is that I really wanted to be a music critic. And so I started sending pieces of writing on spec, uh, which just means you're 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 not being assigned, but you're just sort of pitching it cold. Started sending pieces on spec to several editors. But I had to go through this process of like finding out who those people were, spending time thinking about what to pitch. And um, and that was like, in a way, maybe the most entrepreneurial thing I'd ever done, because um, it really is just trying to hustle something up. And and I got such great feedback and that the couple of first times I did this, it worked. It worked. And so that was just such a great, um, you know, just just a great cycle. Uh, but I think the, the big change was I got laid off by my job. I got a job working for a big company. It was a small company that got bought by a big company that owned a lot of radio stations, Clear Channel. And they had layoffs and I got laid off. And, um, and which was tough. I had a year, almost a year of being unemployed. Um, and then got a job, um, got a job with a small company called Flavor Pill that was like an email newsletter business um, listing events. And, and I, I got hired at the bottom of the ladder, um, but it was such an open company and very much a startup that within six weeks, I was, you know, co-leading many things with, you know, a, a wonderful woman, Jocelyn Gly, who had been running things for a while. And, and just like, just being in this open environment um, where you could just make an impact through caring and working hard, that was just really rewarding. And, and, and a lot of what was initially challenging for me was that for me as a creative person to be good inside a company, to be good in a meeting, to care was um, like made me feel worried. It felt like I was a, a traitor uh, to myself a little bit because the divide between being a business person and being a creative person was so strong, was so strong. I and mean, if you work in a company where you're the editorial person, like, you know, the marketing people are thinking about things differently than you and you get your you get your story of resentment and, you know, whatever, Th these things happen. Um, but I had to confront this fact of being good at something that I didn't intend to be good at, which is like organizational thinking and, um, but found it fun and, and found that actually applying my skills as a writer and as, and as a thinker to those spaces was just as rewarding and you could have this amazing impact. And um, so that was really kind of an entrepreneurial experience. And, and that, that turned into another role, um, which, you know, and Kickstarter happened uh, not long after that. But I, you know, I was, I was quite, I, I was fortunate to have jobs and not amazing companies, but companies that where I could have enough freedom and responsibility to take some risks to fail in a way that, you know, could never be that bad. Um, but even after Kickstarter, you know, there, there are three, three co-founders of Kickstarter and the other two co-founders had been full time on it for over a year before I was before I quit my job to join because I had you know I I I had a uh, these other projects going that I was proud of and um, yeah so it was um, and how did you come together with them like how did Kickstarter start what was the inspiration yeah the the inspiration was uh, had by Perry Chen um, and Perry was living in New Orleans in 2001, 2002, and wanted to throw a concert and was going to have to um, front about $20,000 to make it happen. And instead, he thought, what if I propose the idea for the concert online and people put up their credit cards, but no one is charged unless the show sells out? And that way, he wouldn't have to bear all the risk and responsibility. It could be a collective decision. So he had that idea in 01, 02, and we met in 2005, um, and he had moved back to New York where he was from, and we met at a restaurant where he worked waiting tables, and I was a regular. It was just, it was a very cool spot, and, um, and we became friends uh, over bonding over basketball, and one night he said, hey, I've had this idea I've been thinking about, and, um, and so we, we hung out later that night, and he had me sign an NDA and then, uh, and then shared this idea. And it was the idea for crowdfunding. And my initial reaction was to say I didn't like it, was to say this reminds me of American Idol. And, you know, this is like 2005 Ruben Studdard era. And, uh, and, you know, and I'm like, we don't need people voting on culture. 
you know, we need, we need curators to have more, you know, be more empowered, et cetera. And, you know, and, and just Perry responded by saying like, but think about the person who lives in a place where no one around them gets what they do, but they have like their internet niche. Like we're thinking about internet niche people. And, and in that, you know, that was much more clear to me. And so immediately we began talking about, well, you know, I love, I love, you know, David Lynch. I would, I would prepay for any David Lynch movie. And, and it was around this time of thinking about the way fans could step in and have a greater say in what happens with um, the cultural, you know, the, the cultural experiences they love. Uh, around that time, Arrested Development was getting canceled. Um, it was the first time it was getting canceled. And so we had this idea of what if we tried to use this idea we have of Kickstarter to save Arrested Development. And Perry had gone to college with the cousin of one of the stars of the show, David Cross, who plays Tobias Funke on the show. And so Perry met with David to pitch him on the idea of using Kickstarter to save Arrested Development. David very patiently explained that we clearly didn't know how the entertainment business worked and that there's no way anyone would go for this. But out of that, uh, he became Kickstarter's very first investor. And the earliest backers of the company were many of of them were artists who saw this challenge of if I try to go get an idea funded, I'm having to prove to some executive or some label owner that what I do is going to be a hit, that they're going to make a lot of money on me doing this. And, you know, maybe sometimes projects have that kind of motivation, but for most artists, for most creative people, the goal is not to get rich. It's to manifest the idea in your head so that it feels right, so that it sounds right. And that whatever happens after that is a kind of gravy that you, you hope for, but isn't the purpose of what you're doing. Um, and so they connected with the idea of a universe where ideas could be funded just because people wanted them to. And, and so that, that was really what, what was motivating us, was a, a, a place where creative projects, and from the beginning it was just creative projects, where creative projects could be funded simply because a community of people wanted them to exist not because they had the potential to be profitable for someone else. Amazing. And obviously that took off quite well. And I dare I say, really changed the landscape of how we as a society look at funding now. I think at the beginning, you know, like you, um, people would go, well, you know, I'm not, I don't really understand. I don't now people use crowdfunding for all sorts of different things, all sorts of different endeavors. And it's a, it's a normal part of our society now, kind of like in this post-COVID era, Zoom, everybody knows what it is, but for the last years, nobody had any idea. And I think that um, what you guys did really had such an impact on our society and on the way people interact and the way people decide how to spend their money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I was really, as it started to take off, like I kept waiting for someone to come knock on our door and it would be like five people in suits with clipboards just to double check that we're all good, you know? And, and I just had this sense that th there was some structure and order to the world. And, um, and as we began having such a big impact and, and, and people really were buying into it and it was really sh changing behavior, um, I, I had an initial feeling of almost panic because it just, it, it made me uncomfortable that the world could change that easily because I just, I jumped to this thought of like, well, if it was like this for us, then maybe most things are like this. And maybe a lot of things that to me seem like deep self-evident truths are just things that we just stopped questioning. And, um, and I, I really did have a feeling of fear um, just, just experiencing that because it just didn't fit how I thought things were supposed to go. Um, eventually I became more comfortable with that. And, and then and then just really wanted to find ways to communicate that feeling to others uh, because it's a powerful, it is a powerful realization. And I've seen Steve Jobs give a great quote about it before about like, you realize that the people who made the world before are no smarter or different than us. 
Um, and there, there is a moment that you kind of realize that. And, um, and it, it does, it just makes you see the world, the world quite differently. But, but the, the degree to which, I mean, the way the Kickstarter grew was very interesting because we, we really limited access to it. We made it to where uh, for you to be able to launch a project, you had to be personally invited by us or a, or a creator already connected to Kickstarter. Um, and so as a new thing, we created a feeling of scarcity and it was interesting to be on the platform. And, and what that also meant was that it was really validated community by community, relationship by relationship. I, I remember very vividly a couple months in, um, there hadn't been many dance projects to date. And, uh, and suddenly there was like an Indian classical dance project. I believe it was in Chicago. It was the first one like it that we'd seen. I knew every project. I looked at every project before they went live. Um, and within a week, there were like 10 more Indian classical dance projects from all around the country. And what I saw in that was, oh, these, this first creator, they sent out their project to their network. That network includes other people who do this. Them getting informed about it from someone that's already in their community gives it a form of a kind of validation. And here is how this spreads. And, and really, we always, we, you know, we, we just always saw Kickstarter growing in that kind of way. It was community by community validation and, and all based on the platform serving real utility and being useful. It's just being like incredibly useful. Here's a way to get money to do things. Here's a way to gather people to do things. And, and just that wasn't possible before, as strange as, that, as it is to think of, the, of that. And so basically, I feel like Kickstarter built a door where no one knew a door needed to build, be built, but yet there absolutely needed to be one. And, and there was a, maybe an inevitability of this idea happening. Um, but I think that, yeah, it's uh, just experiencing it and seeing it from, you know, from early on to now really, really shapes how you see the rest of the world, too. Amazing. Yeah, it, I mean, it really has changed the world. And so I have so many questions I could ask you around this, but I want to also be aware of the time and I'd love for us to get to kind of your next endeavors as well. So, um, you know, how did the book come to be and what did you do from Kickstarter? Like, how did you leverage that to more of what you wanted in your life? Well, I, I stepped away. I stepped down as CEO um, three years ago, uh, almost exactly. And that was after 10 years um, full time, the last four years as CEO. Uh, and yeah, I was tired and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And, and I felt a bit confused because, you know, you, for a decade, you, you base your identity off of a job, right? And of course, it's more than a job to say it's a job. It's a, put it too small. But if you define yourself in that kind of way, and then you lose that, you have this moment of like, well, who, you know, who is just Yancey? You know, I know who Kickstarter guy is. Like, I've been that guy, but who, who is this other person? So I, I, um, I ended up using a lot of the same kind of corporate brainstorming tools that I would use in leadership for myself. I build a notebook up with like, what are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? What's every project I've ever done before? Um, and coming up with different ways of ranking these things and, and using them to generate possible next steps in my life. And out of this sort of week-long process, uh, there were these five potential life paths that I saw. I was like, be a journalist again, be a, a teacher, turn a side project into a company Get the other two. Uh, and the following week, I woke up each day and I pretended to be that job, to have that job. I didn't, I can talk myself into anything, but I wanted like my body to tell me. So, like that Monday, I woke up and pretended I was a freelance journalist and I spent the day researching stories, who I was going to pitch them to, writing a piece on spec, you know, just living that life again. And, um, and it was when I, spent a day writing this on the idea of writing a book um, and working on trying to kind of share the same feeling I'm talking about of seeing the world as it truly operates um, and, and trying to empower people with that, both that knowledge and that feeling 
the day I spent doing that, I could just tell was, was right for me. And, um, and so I sort of let my body guide me and to find the right answer. And so I began working on, on this book and, um, and the book is, it, the first half is about, it's called This Could Be Our Future, A Manifesto for a More Generous World. And, and the, book, the first half of the book is about kind of what I observed as a CEO and what I observed in the world around us, which is a, a culture that has been increasingly overtaken by a belief in, in money and financial value. And, and I argue that the book operates according to, I, oper, I argue that the world operates according to a hidden default that the right choice in any decision is whichever option makes the most money. And this belief in financial maximization is this implicit decider uh, in every fork in the road. And, and first I show that this idea hasn't been around forever. It's about 50 years old, the 1970s, this came to pass. So we might think that it's always been this way. It, it hasn't. And I, I give lots of evidence for that. And then the second half of the book, I introduce a, a new philosophy and, and a way where I think we should build. Um, because I, you know, I, I'm optimistic about human beings and, and, and I think we're all doing the best we can with what we know. So the question is always, well, what don't we know? What don't we know that could be useful? And, and for me, thinking hard about that question and thinking hard about a lot of what I experienced in the business world, um, I came to feel that the, the two key realizations that we can make are, are one is to redefine how we see our self-interest and second is to redefine how we can how we define what's valuable so for self-interest we tend to think of our self-interest as what we want right this second what what we as a person want to need you know self-interest is you go get yours i go get mine and the modern world is really built on this assumption and and we sort of Visualize this as like a hockey stick graph of a line going up and to the right. Um, and, and Adam Smith's notion of capitalism is that you can, you can trust a person to operate according to their self-interest and that a, a world based on tr trust and self-interest is one that could operate you know, exceptionally well. The challenge, the problem is that we've, we've settled on this very narrow definition of self-interest of now me. And in the book, I introduce a philosophy that argues our, our self-interest is more expansive than that. That our now me is, is in our self-interest, absolutely, but so is future me. Future me is the older, wiser version of ourself, the person that we want to be, the person that we hope we become. That person becomes true or not true every day based on our choices. There's also now us, the, our family, our friends, the people that we care about. And there's also future us, our children, if we have them, or everybody else's children, if we don't. And so we can actually think of there being four distinct dimensions of our self-interest, now me, future me, now us, and future us. Every choice we make leaves a footprint in all of these spaces. And yet today, we're blind to everything other than now me. And so when I first had this idea, I visualized it as like a little two-by-two two matrix, a simple four squares, a box. And next to it, I wrote, what is this a graph? What is this a picture of? And I wrote down beyond near-term orientation. This is, a, this is a framework for how to see beyond the near term. You're seeing the future. You're seeing one another. And I realized that, that that description was an acronym for bento. And I thought, oh, this is a bento box, the Japanese packed lunch that has four compartments and a lid that lets people carry a variety of dishes uh, without anything getting spoiled and, and letting you have a diverse meal. And the bento also honors a Japanese dieting philosophy called hara hachibu, which says the goal of a meal is to be 80% full. That way you're still hungry for tomorrow. So bentoism is the same idea, but for our values, our choices, and our self-interest, a way to not just indulge on now me, but to leave space and to create explicit room to think about our future selves and other people. And so this, this transition from a now me and a selfish, individualistic, short-term oriented world to a worldview that is more expansive and that says, you know what, the future is part of our rational decision space. You know what, the, the, the interests of others are a part of our self-interest. That, I believe, is what starts to enable a very different world because our choices look quite differently once you expand your perimeter in that kind of way. This is fascinating. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, 
honestly, I'm like just so drawn in. I'm going, I don't have any questions, just keep talking. But I also am aware that the time is coming to where we need to start wrapping up. So um, how inspiring. Now, where can people go get your book and, um, and learn more? The book is available, you know, all, all the places books are available. There's, there's an audio book of me reading it for 10 hours, if you are into that. Um, you know, bentoism.org is a website that teaches you the model. And, uh, and it's, an, it's an amazing website. I made it with my friend, Laurel Schultz, and it feels like going to a spa. We intentionally built it to where everything moves at like 80% speed. So it's a place you can just relax and reflect. Um, I do a lot of events. I do three events every week for anyone interested in bentoism. And um, one is called the weekly bento. And there we uh, go through different exercises to embody our different dimensions of ourselves. So I will create a meditation where I have people close their eyes and look straight ahead as if we're looking into the mirror of now me, we take stock of ourselves. We tilt our heads up and imagine we're looking up at the space of now us and I tell people to picture their family, their friends, their coworkers, everyone that's important to them and to cram them all together on a couch and that everyone's laughing at how silly it is to all be together. And at that moment, to take a Polaroid and then look at that picture and see those people. Those are your us. And so we scan their faces in our minds and just sort of see those people and, and recognize them. Um, future us, we imagine that same Polaroid, but 20 years from now, you know, the, the young people in the photos are scarily bigger. Some of them have their own kids. Some people have disappeared from the earlier photo. But we look at that picture and recognize that those people, their lives are affected by decisions we make right now. And finally, we look at future me, the older, wiser version of you. And I, I ask people to imagine the, the salt and pepper version of you. You're wiser. Your skin is more wrinkled. Um, but you smile. That future, future me smiles at you with such warmth. They, they feel such compassion for you. They know that you are just trying to do your best in the same way that you look upon your 13-year-old self, someone who is struggling in a, in a hard world. That's how your future me looks at you. And so we, we sort of live in those spaces and then we write and reflect and journalize them and use those voices to generate what it is that we want to do. And we're, and we're always thinking in a, a seven-day horizon. What do we want to do in the next week? Because you know, our values, our goals can be things that um, sit on a shelf, they can hang on a wall, um, or they could be things that you're doing every week. And, and it's not easy to do them every week. It takes practice. It takes muscle memory. And, you know, I, I view the bento as just a reflection, even for me, of, 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 of how short I fall of, of my own desires for myself that I need a tool to help me live up to who I want to be and who I most deeply am. And that for me, the bento is the simplest thing I could think of and, 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 that, and has been like really useful to me on a day-to-day -day basis to ground my decisions in meaning, right? To, to, to have a notion of future me, a future us, to have a sense of a destination puts you so far ahead of, of everyone else around you because everyone else is trapped in this passive now me view, right? And most people struggle to think beyond the next 48 hours. And so to have any notion of a plan gives you such an advantage and it allows you, it allows every decision that you make, every decision, even if it seems unrelated, it can make, allows you to make every decision be coherent with this larger purpose. And so everything you're doing, even things you don't want to do, you are building you are building the, the version of you, the experience that you want to have. You can do it on your terms. Even, even things you don't want to do, you can do selfishly in a way that you can own them and, 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 just, and really build and manifest the person and the world uh, that you want. And so that, that is something that I, I fully believe is, is within all of our power. And it just takes, it takes self-awareness and it takes practice. And, um, and so I think the bento and these community gatherings and these workshops are, are just a, a way to really practically put that in people's hands. I love it. Everything about it. And so where again, can people go to what website to, um, to get involved with this? Yeah, for that, you can just go to my website, whystrickler.com, my first initial last name. Um, and it's also on bentoism.org. Perfect. 
as if you haven't already given us plenty of words of wisdom. Uh, before we wrap, again, the floor is yours. So any final words of wisdom, anything you want to really um, have my audience take away from being with you for the last half hour? Yeah, that we are at the, you know, those of us who are live right now, we've lived through the peak of a uh, regime based on the maximization of financial self-interest. That is the world around us today. We, we all felt how eternal that world seemed. And right now we're watching its demise and, and its decline. And, and the responsibility, which is exciting and immense, um, but the responsibility for designing and building what comes after this is going to rest on the shoulders of generations X, Y, and Z. And those generations have a different belief system than others. You know, it's true that age changes people's beliefs, but I think these generations show a remarkably different set of beliefs. And the question is, as, as they are and as we are rebuilding, what is the foundation that we're doing that on? What, what core assumption are we making differently than the people who made these decisions before? And I believe that core assumption should be that we are four-dimensional beings that only thinking of our self-interest as now me, that can work, but for only so long. If we want lasting prosperity, if we want real connection and meaningness, we have to see all four dimensions of ourselves. And, and I fully believe that this will happen. I, I fully expect this to happen. It, it, it's probably not going to be the bento language exactly. But our, our notion of self-interest will expand because we will learn that it is in our self-interest when we do so, that it benefits us. And so I think that uh, out of the wreckage of this moment, um, I think this is the lesson that's going to stand out and will be the foundation for what comes next. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And there you have it. Thanks again for tuning in. I do realize that there are about a million other things you could have been doing over the past half hour. And the fact that you chose to spend it listening to this podcast means the world to me. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from today's episode was. So feel free to send it on social, tagging me at the Nicole Holland on Facebook or Instagram, or send me a message from my website, fascinatingfounders.com. You'll also find show notes with the transcript from this and all other past and future podcast episodes on the website. That URL once more is fascinatingfounders.com. Thanks to my podcasting goldmine team for the production of today's episode and a special shout out to Effie Ceruti for composing the intro and outro music for this season. If you're looking for custom composed music for your own podcast, or any other aspect of strategy, design, or production for your existing or new podcast, the Podcasting Goldmine team can help. Give us a ring at 218-GET-SEEN or contact us through the website for a custom quote. And once again, if you are ready to explore effectively leveraging podcasts for business growth, visit podcastinggoldmine.com and request a complimentary consultation to explore making podcasts work for you. Again, that URL is podcastinggoldmine.com. Coming up on Fascinating Founders, I'm excited to introduce you to more fascinating men and women who've taken their inspired idea and against all odds have grown it into a multi-million or billion dollar enterprise. Until next time, this is Nicole Holland signing off. 